Everything ends. And it's always sad. But everything begins again, too. And that's always happy. Be happy. Welcome back to Crawford Clark Close-Up and our Doctor Who retrospective of all the Doctor's eras since the show was reborn for audiences back in 2005. With the departure of Matt Smith and his emotionally charged regeneration episode providing the culmination to the show's 50th anniversary celebrations, it was time for the new incumbent Peter Capaldi to take to the TARDIS. Almost as soon as fans were aware of Matt Smith's intentions not to return to the role after three seasons, with the decision having been made in 2013, the show's 50th year of transmission, the big question was, who will take his place? As early as 2013, some fans were thinking that the BBC might infer gender politics onto the character and have the eponymous Doctor regenerate into the female of the species. This wasn't to be, as in August 2013, the BBC decided to air a full introduction to the new Doctor programme, with TV and radio personality Zoe Ball revealing the best-kept secret that 55-year-old Scottish actor Peter Capaldi will be taking over the role as the 12th Doctor, a hero for a whole new generation. A hardcore fan of the show from a young age, Capaldi, the second oldest actor to take on the role after William Hartnell's debut in 1963, they were both 55 years old when they began making Who, was like a kid in a sweet shop on discovering the role was his to make his own, and he didn't look back from there. Although his full debut on screen in Series 8's Deep Breath wouldn't premiere until August the 23rd, 2014, there was his hurrah moment in the special The Day of the Doctor for fans just three months after his announcement as Smith's successor, with an extreme close-up of his determined eyes and monster eyebrows, followed by his one-minute startled entrance onto the TARDIS at the end of The Time of the Doctor on Christmas Day 2013 after Matt Smith has regenerated. Proclaiming that he doesn't like the colour of his new kidneys, and confessing that he doesn't know how to fly the TARDIS, his interpretation of the Doctor, though older in looks, would still be as young at heart as the role's previous incumbents. From the serious publicity shots of Capaldi in early 2014, with dark coat complete with red lining and his intense stares straight to camera, fans knew they were in for a staggeringly different interpretation of this titular hero that we'd had in a long time. At least at first, it seemed like gone were the witty remarks and the cheeky one-liners in favour of a sardonic, grisly man coming to terms with his personality, questioning why he has this face and what his purpose really is. A carryover from the late Matt Smith era was Jenna Coleman as enigmatic companion Clara Oswald. It's always underestimated how challenging the role of the companion is and how difficult it is for the actor or actress to find themselves suddenly working with an actor who has an entirely different approach to this character than his predecessor. But it was clear that Capaldi and Coleman would bounce off each other effectively and it made their initially frosty dynamic in series 8 all the more intriguing to study for the fans of the show. The thing that most fans find hard to argue against is that there was a significant come down after the roaring success of the show's 50th year, as it was the end of an era, saying goodbye to Matt Smith, again one of the most popular iterations of the Doctor, and we were making way for a Doctor who was a bit more hostile and took no prisoners. It even takes Matt Smith's Doctor cameoing at the end of Capaldi's first episode to encourage Clara to give the new guy a chance, as he's as scared as she is. This is inspired writing again from continuing showrunner Stephen Moffat. He's ensuring both a sceptical Clara and Doctor Who audiences that Capaldi will be different, but no less engaging than his predecessors. Another aspect hard to ignore is that Stephen Moffat was at pains to work out what kind of Doctor Capaldi was during his era. Between series 8 and 9, he seems to get a radical transformation from stern and wary to Mr. Cool, wearing specs, Patrick Troughton throwback patch trousers, and strumming a guitar. Whether this abrupt change in tone for the character worked or not on audiences, I can't personally say, but it was certainly jarring for this reviewer. 
The quality of writing during Capaldi's run had a direct impact on this, as we have some of the very best episodes of New Who during Capaldi's run, particular highlights being Mummy on the Orient Express and Heaven Sent, yet we also have some truly dismal episodes. In the Forest of the Night could give Peter Kay's Absorbaloff a run for its money. That said, by series 10, Moffat, and to some extent Capaldi himself, had managed to get the tone of the Twelfth Doctor down, and it's certainly his most consistent series of the three. Like his predecessors, Capaldi had plenty of time and love for the devoted fans, more so than perhaps anyone before him. He could relate to the Doctor Who mania as he had been devoted to the show from such a young age, and now it was people of all ages idolising him as the character. So it was with sadness that Capaldi announced on BBC Radio in early 2017 that Series 10 would be his last as the Time Lord, and he would go out with a bang once again on Christmas Day in 2017 to make way for Doctor No. 13. Despite the fact that his era was one of mixed quality, Capaldi gave his all to the character and clearly relished his time at the helm of the most popular sci-fi serial of all time. It's time for us to take a look at our five favourite episodes from the Capaldi era of the show. Before we do that, however, we have one or two honourable mentions that marginally sit outside our top five. There may be some surprises here, but bear in mind that, as with our previous ranking episodes, we're counting two-part stories as one entry, not two. And whilst we love one half of a two-part story, the other half may drag things down, meaning that it doesn't make our top five overall. With that in mind, the first honourable mention is for Heaven Sent and Hell Bent. A case in point, Heaven Sent is remarkable Who, and represents some of Capaldi's finest acting within Who, or even outside the series. But it's followed up with Hell Bent that almost goes entirely full circle and makes a mockery of the brilliant first part of the story. That's why it doesn't quite make our top five. Also sitting just outside are Series 10, Episodes 4 and 5, Knock Knock and Oxygen, which are both highly underrated episodes during Capaldi's run, and Series 8, episodes, Episode 4's Listen. Here we go then, with our Capaldi Top 5. And we kick things off as we mean to go on with the brilliant Series 8, Episode 8, Mummy on the Orient Express. The countdown is set, 66 seconds from the moment you glimpse the bandaged mummy until your death. Can the Doctor stop the mummy's curse in time? This is an engaging entry with the Doctor on his finest form in the whole of Capaldi's first season. There's great cinematography on the set of the Orient Express in space, and the premise is an intriguingly, intriguing one fruitfully executed throughout. At number four, this is going to come as a surprise to a lot of fans, we have the Series 8 Christmas special, Last Christmas. Santa Claus meets Alien in a gripping, clever concept for a Christmas special. Nick Frost is fantastic as Santa, Danny Pink returns in a way you're not expecting, and the only thing about the episode that they should have followed through with is that this should have been the true finale for Clara Oswald as the Doctor's companion. It's not your typical schmaltzy Christmas fare, but it's a brilliant story and once again makes fans warm to Capaldi's Doctor. In third place, it's the first two-parter from Capaldi's run to make the cut. Series 10, episodes 11 and 12, World Enough and Time and The Doctor Falls. A surprising, bombastic, emotional series finale that Capaldi's Doctor deserved. Capaldi shares the screen with two masters, a return to the classic Mondasian Cybermen, and there's an emotional farewell that has Moffat tugging on our heartstrings. It's a beautifully written two-parter representing the beginning of the end of Capaldi's run. Just missing out on the top spot at number two is Series 9, Episodes 8 and 9, The Zygon Invasion and The Zygon Inversion. A hugely entertaining two-parter showcasing some of the very best of Capaldi, with the second part showcasing one of the Doctor's very best anti-war speeches. It's an empowered speech that demonstrates the range of Capaldi's acting and conviction as the Doctor. It's also interesting to see a different side to Jenna Coleman's Clara Oswald played out in this story. We have a triumphant return for the Zygons as the primary foe as well, instead of the all-too-familiar Daleks or Cybermen, which is a pleasant surprise, as well 
well as Kate Lethbridge Stewart and Osgood returning to the fold for the second time in Capaldi's run after their appearances in the series eight finale. That means we're about to reveal the top placed episode of the Capaldi era. This was actually the hardest of all four New Who Doctors lists to generate, but it really can only be for its ingenuity and for two doctors working together, the series 10 Christmas special Twice Upon a Time. There's perfect chemistry between the first incarnation of the Doctor and the Twelfth here, with David Bradley reprising the role of the first Doctor that he took to like a duck to water in an adventure in space and time for the show's 50th anniversary. Bill also returns to the Doctor's side on his final adventure, and we have cameos from Matt Lucas's actually entertaining Nardold and Jenna Coleman's Clara. There are also crowd-pleasing nods to the Doctor's past throughout, and a magical recreation of the Tenth Planet, William Hartnell's final story as the first Doctor from 1966. Without a doubt, this is the strongest and most consistent regeneration episode for New Who so far. If you're not feeling a little wet at the eye during the recreation of the World War I Christmas Armistice, then this is wasted on you. As perfect a send-off for Capaldi's Doctor as we could have got, and of course, that regeneration that's paving the way for our first female Time Lord, or Time Lady, Jodie Whittaker, who, as this review is going live, will have just begun her adventures in all of time and space, with a new set of companions taking the series forward into its 55th year. Before we go, as well as In the Forest of the Night, there are a few more Capaldi-era episodes that are on the bottom of the pile. Our dishonourable mentions also include Series 9, Episode 9, Sleep No More, an experimental episode that had good intentions but was poorly executed and felt jarring in a series of largely two-part adventures. Series 8, Episode 7, Kill the Moon. We all know that Moffat dropped a bomb here with this messy story. And Series 10, Episode 9, The Empress of Mars, a largely dull Ice Warriors episode that dragged down Series 10 before the big finale. So, there you have it. Over the last four months, in preparation for the return of Doctor Who to our screens this autumn, we've covered all the new Who Doctors, from Eccleston kicking things off nicely back in 2005, to the hugely popular David Tennant taking over the same year, to the youngest ever Doctor, Matt Smith, in 2010, and one of the oldest and most philosophical of all the Doctors to date, with Peter Capaldi from 2014. And of course, thrown in for good measure, the War Doctor, as played by the late, great John Hurt. Only time will tell how Jodie Whittaker will fit into the Hooniverse, but we're willing to give her a chance when she makes her debut on October the 7th, 2018. Stay tuned to Crawford Clark Close Up over the next year as we'll be working our way through Classic Who, returning to the very beginning of this historic show and the episodes of First Doctor William Hartnell right up to Paul McGann in the Doctor Who movie from 1996. We've also got plenty more horror reviews to come this month as we count down to the release of the 40th anniversary of John Carpenter's Halloween in a few weeks' time. For now, if you enjoyed this review, please subscribe to Crawford Clark Close Up. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter, and you can drop us an email with suggestions for the channel, CrawfordClarkCloseUp at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, and until next time, that's a wrap.